think their last number was 17 books in SQL Server and machine learning. He's also, uh, he used to be a, uh, actually uh, the lecturer at university. So he has lots of actually interesting uh, kind of topics in SQL Server, machine learning. I learned a lot from him. So uh, I totally recommend to actually, uh, Reza also doing the live streaming and it's been recorded. So you will be access to uh, all of this material. So, um, I'm going to, so the title is Business Analysis with TSQL, uh, but I want that uh, Dion uh, himself explain what is uh, actually was his session about. I'm just going to check with him to see that we can share his screen. So Dion, uh, could you please, uh, I, I stop sharing so you can kind of share your screen. Okay, let me share my screen. So I guess you already see my screen and you should also be able to see a little bit of me. And here is my virtual machine. Do you see everything? Yes, you can see. Thank you. So also I said that we are live. So if you have any question at the end, uh, you can actually, in the meantime, you can type it here. So if Dion wants to ask question, we can actually, uh, if he wants to answer question, we kind of reflect. So if everyone has a question, please type in the chat window. We will let the Dion, uh, we let Dion know about that. And also, yeah, so uh, yeah, please, Dion, it's, it's yours, please. <laughs> Okay, thank you very much. So now I will turn off my camera to save oh. some bandwidth. Uh, right. Definitely, I will do. I will do everything. Just give me a second. So I will turn my camera off, and uh, also this uh, this uh, uh, control window and. I think we are ready for the presentation. So I will also ask you to turn your microphones off for a while unless you want to uh, speak ask something. So what I'm going to talk about today is uh, business analysis with SQL. I have to think what I'm saying. I wanted to say this morning, but then I remember it's already evening in Auckland. So it's morning for me. So business analysis with T-SQL. Um, as Leila already introduced me, I'm uh, Diane Sarka from Slovenia. I'm in this area uh, more than 35 years uh, and wrote many things and been data platform MVP now for 20 year in a row. So what I'm going to talk about is the following topics. I will introduce relational division and how it is useful. And then what is so-called ABC analysis, survival analysis, and then even some more advanced analytical techniques that are typically reserved for statistical languages like R, Python. So I will talk about market basket analysis, lookalike model, and Bayesian inference. <clears throat> so what's the point of this um, presentation and these techniques? Well, you know that uh, T-SQL is not so um, analytical or analytically oriented like especially R, also Python and some other languages and tools. Um, however, you can still do a lot of things without learning a new language. And what is even more important, when we talk about performance, you have to realize that um, companies like Microsoft, IBM, Oracle in invested decades of development in performance of relational database management systems. So systems like uh, SQL Server, Oracle, DB2 are really optimized to work with huge amounts of data. And now we are going even in the cloud, so we have the Azure SQL database, which you can easily scale up and even Azure Synapse Analytics, which is kind of data warehouse in the cloud that also supports TransactiQL. So all together, you can really, really handle billions of rows of data, while in languages like R and Python, you typically want to work with much, much smaller samples. Otherwise, uh, otherwise of course, you might come into troubles with performance. 
Um, also, some of these techniques are less known. Um, and still, Transact SQL language has also some drawbacks. It is very slow in loops, like while loop or even corridors. So I want to avoid these kind of loops. But um, we shouldn't forget that we have some expression that is actually a hidden loop. So Transact SQL adds apply operator to the standard SQL, ANSI SQL, which is kind of for each loop. So for each loop in the from the left row set, you apply some tabular expression expression in the right side. So actually, we do have for each loop, just it is not named so. Anyway, this is a little bit more longer, a little bit longer presentation that you are used to. It's also pretty advanced, so it will be like 75 minutes. And I do expect you have some, well, uh, more than just basic knowledge with Transact SQL because I'm not going to explain exactly the expressions, how do you write common uh, table expressions, how do you write window functions. I will just use them and explain mathematics behind the logic behind this analysis. Okay, so I guess uh, after this pretty lengthy introduction, it's time to start. And let me talk about the relational division. What is it? What are the uh, drawbacks where you can use it? So first of all, this is a very, very old technique, theoretically introduced already by Mr. Koch in 1970. So uh, you can imagine that this is like 50 years old, yet it is still uh, quite unknown, and there is no relational division operator in Transact SQL or even in Standard SQL. Although, as I said, Mr. Koch already defined it theoretically in 70. So what is here the logic? So first, for some definitions, a divisor relation partitions a dividend relation to produce a quotient relation. Of course, we are talking about relations. However, the important thing is that dividend and divisor are in many-to-many -many relationships, and the quotient is made up of those values of one attribute from the dividend relation for which you can find in the intermediate relation all of the values from the second column from the divisor relation. What does it mean? Let me show this graphically. So I have here on the right side of the slide, I have a dividend relation, which is ABC, and a divisor relation, which is XZ, and they are in the middle, they have a relation that is um, a resolution of many-to-many -many relationships, and you can see that uh, the element A from the dividend is connected to both elements from the divisor, X and Z. It is also connected to element Y, which is not in divisor, we don't care about this. Uh, element C is not connected to anything from divisor. Element B is connected only to X and not to Z. So the result, the quotient is A. It means uh, all, give me elements from the dividend, which is connected to all elements or to every single element from the divisor. Now, what is the um, real-life logic here? So, for example, when you analyze your customers, you want to find those customers that are buying all different kinds of products or maybe all different kinds of product categories that you are selling. Um, this is not too complex problem to solve in Transact SQL. Um, however, I would just like to point out a small issue that can happen. Um, first, let me tell you that there are two solutions. You can use group by with herring clause, which is pretty safe from the, let's say, real life. And you can use exist and not exist operators, uh, more from this descriptive relational calculus way. And here is a small thread. If the divisor relation is empty, then the result is full dividend relation. So it means if you have customers, you have products, if you filter out products, so the dividend, uh, the divisor relation is empty, then the result is all customers. Like all customers have purchased all products. This is correct due, uh, according to mathematical logic. The condition is fulfilled on emptiness, which means we can turn this around. 
you cannot find a single customer um, for which you wouldn't be able to find a product that this customer haven't bought. So it's very hard to comprehend this, but basically it means since there are no products, every customer bought all products. Or even give me another example. So this is logically correct, however, not, uh, not very counterintuitive for real life. For example, you have a, a bar, and then you have some guests, and then you have some waitress, waiters, and uh, you are searching for guests that will be, will, were served by all waiters. And if there is no waiter, the result is all guests have been served by all waiters. However, uh, there is nobody drinking anything. So it's kind of funny, mathematically correct, yet in real life a little bit illogical or not something you would expect. So I usually add here a additional condition that the visual relation must not be empty. Anyway, let me show you the technique I'm using here. And I will use just having plus, which is safe, safer than exist, not exist. So first I will do some demo from the AdventureWorks DW 2017 database. Let me just show you some data. I'm unioning all sales, internet and the retailer sales. I will use this data later, grouping by years. So I see I have only a few orders in years 2010 and 2014. I will simply filter out those orders for later for survival analysis. So I will create simply two new views where I will uh, select only rows from both tables for years between 2011 and 2013. And now if I select the data from these two views um, and group by year, I see that I have orders for years 2011, 12, and 13. Now let me start doing the analysis, relational division. So first, I can start with customers and number of distinct product categories. I will limit myself to product categories. We have only three categories on sale. So there are four categories in product category, however, components are not on sale. And I'm counting distinct product category name uh, for every single, uh, single customer and I'm also ordering by discount descending. So here are customers. These are customers. This is just minimal name from the category. So these are customers that have purchased products from all three categories. And then if I go down, I have customers that have purchased products from two and only from one category. So let me filter out those customers with having clause. So this is the same way to do the relational division. I'm searching for all those customers where count of distinct product category name is um, the same as counting all product categories from product category dimension without components, of course. And even if this, this set would be empty, I would get an empty result, not all customers with having closed. So these are my customers that actually bought products from all, all categories. So we can maybe even make here some stupid condition. So instead of this one, let me add something like this. So this should be an empty, empty set. Let's see. And, and, We see the result is zero customers, not all customers like I would get if I would use exist and don't exist operators. So make sure if you use exist, don't exist to have additional, uh, additional condition that the divisor relation is not empty. Now this might be, uh, might be handy for some analysis, but let's continue with the next one. So very, very popular is so-called ABC analysis. So this is a categorization method in which an entity set of an interest is divided into three categories, A, B, and C in the standing values. And they have the highest value for you, probably gives you the highest profit or highest sales. B is lower than A, and C has the lowest value for you. 
And typically we're searching for top 20 customers, top 70% of customers that contribute to 70 or 80% of the product. And uh, typically B items are then around 30% and C items 50% of the occasional customers typically contribute to uh, around 5% of the profit only. Also, very known is Pareto principle 20, 80, 80, 20. Um, this is just a specific example of ABC analysis where you simply join or union B items and C items into a single group. So let's go and do this analysis. So I can define what are my cost, top cost customers based on many, many different um, different input columns. For example, I can simply count the number of order lines, so how many products have they purchased. So I'm using a column table expression to count the number of order lines for every single customer. So this is absolute frequency and I'm also counting absolute percentage. And then I can do the cumulative, this is in common table expression, and then I can use window aggregate functions to calculate the cumulative frequency and cumulative percentage. And also I can use a small trick to replicate stars to also show the histogram. So let me show you this, and of course, order by count of rows descending, and I see I have top customer 11,300 with 67 order lines, which is 0.11 and something percentage. And here we have cumulative frequency and cumulative histogram. Now I would try to find the cutoff points for 20% of the best customers. And it looks like this is not really good division based on order lines. Um, customers do not have so much difference in the amount of order lines. There are only few customers with a lot of order lines. So let's do this differently. Let's try to analyze products. So I will calculate sales amount for every single product from both sales, aggregate them, and then again um, do some uh, window aggregate functions and uh, calculate rank and running total and running percentage of aggregated sales amount over product model. Now here I expect more interesting results since products of course have different prices. So what you can see is that the top product mounting 200 already contributes nearly 15% to total sales. And if we make cut at 80%, we see that only 11 products contribute to 80% of sales. So this is this uh, Pareto principle we really, really implemented. And you can see that I found the most, most important product. Okay. Now let me just mention that um, every next analysis this will be a little bit more complex, but I hope I will manage to explain it in such a way that you will see the logic behind it. So survival analysis might be quite, quite important for your business. Um, so what you are searching here is how long will uh, customers be faithful to you and to estimate the lifespan of this population. Um, you can also turn the logic around and uh, measure time to event analysis, which event means that customers uh, customer has left you. Um, and also this is useful for, for uh, machines. So for any kind of machines, it's very important piece of data mean time between failure. So this is also similar analysis. Now, um, here we have a couple of issues when we do this analysis. Sometimes you know exact time when a subject or customer has joined you, and especially important exact time when customer left you. This is when you can the subscriptions, and when some customer can the subscription, you know, you, got, you lost this customer. Um, however, 
uh, what can happen is, of course, like in retail stores or uh, any other business that, uh, that doesn't work through subscriptions, is the customer can let you exit at any time of the study. Of course, you can find the entrance time since this is your first contact with the customer. But how do you know that if somebody didn't purchase anything from you for three months, that this customer has left forever? So how do you solve this problem? Well, you, you, you calculate, um, calculate uh, risk for, for uh, leaving you for every single period of time. And then you see which periods are the most, the most critical. Um, you, you simply also define a variable that indicates this event. So when you do the analysis, you say, let's see how many customers are still with me one year after they uh, make, made the first purchase. And then you say, okay, those who are um, not with me for more than one year, these are those that have left me. And you define this flag. You can even add some additional knowledge to this flag. Maybe if uh, uh, your typical knowledge here is that you say that this customer left voluntarily or involuntarily, you kick the customer out, maybe the customer didn't play well and so on. So what we define is survival function, which defines the probability that the event has not occurred at time t. So what is the probability that I will have uh, a customer after first contact till after two years? Or uh, the, the, so here you calculate this probability for different periods of time, so you can see what is the probability for survival in one year, or maybe in one quarter, three months, six months, one year, two years, and so on. And the hazard function is the opposite, that the probability that the case will experience an event of interest within some small time interval. Um, this time interval, of course, depends on your type of business. Maybe you can calculate this for every single day, or maybe for weeks or months. Uh, and uh, you can calculate the risk of the event at every single time point. And then cumulative hazard function cumulatively calculates for the risks up to a specific, specific time point. Remember, time points, we say time points, however, there is always, with time will work like it consists of points, although those are intervals. Um, however, we define the length of the interval based on our uh, business needs. When I say day, you know that this is not a point, this is actually 24 hours. However, if I'm not interested in lower granularity, I will use them. Anyway, let's start doing this survival analysis. So, for example, I can search for customers that were not active in the last year when I was selling. So we have years 2011, 12, and 13. So this is not too complex. And what I see is that I have like 548 customers that uh, were not active. However, they were, of course, active in the past. Now, this was one year, but I can define any arbitrary selected cut of days. So for example, I'm interested in those that haven't been active for last 10 months. So my cut of date is 1st of March, 2013. And I am, so I am, I am also calculating uh, how long have they been my customers in days so I'm calculating tenure in days. And I'm sorting by tenure in days descending. So I have this customer store as Ruben, which was faithful to me for more than two years. However, didn't purchase anything in the last 10 months. So this is maybe a customer that I should contact what went wrong. And here is a customer at the end of customers that were active like for a single day, probably single purchase. So these probably are not that uh, so interesting customers. So I will uh, calculate hazard and survival function. 
So I will store this data into a new table called customer survival, and I will calculate um, start date, stop date, tenure date, and for those that left me, I will add a reason which is now made up. So one third of customers will leave me voluntarily and two thirds voluntarily. Okay, a stop reason. And this is my arbitrarily selected start of date. Sorry, must also highlight the last row, otherwise I will get incorrect results. So these are my 414 customers that left me. Now I will add active customers. So active customers mean that customers that purchased something in the past, but have also purchased something in last 10 months. Again, remember this cut of date here was arbitrarily selected. Maybe this is some new fiscal year for my company. So for better performance, I will add some primary key. And let me show you this table. These are survival customers. So this is start date, stop date. Now means the customer is still active, tenure date. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, for those that left me, whether they left me voluntarily or somewhere uh, which probably have also involuntarily. So customers that I kicked out of my system. And these are my minimal and maximal dates, start date uh, and stop date. So you see, uh, max start date means I, these are customers that purchased something before 1st of March 2013. Okay. And uh, max stop date is also uh, 28th of February 2013. So probably some customers have left me just a day before my arbitrary selected cutoff date. So let's check hazard probability up to 365 days. So when tenure date is less than 365 and stop reason is not null, it means this customer left me. So I'm simply summing once for those customers. And then uh, I'm also uh, uh, calculating the percentage. I'm calculating for every single customer that left me um, 100 average of uh, at 100 for other zero and then calculate average so I get percentage that have succumbed to risk or left me. So I have uh, in 365 days population at least these are our customers uh, nearly 7,000 only 183 left me within one year, which is 2.67 percentage. And customers that survived at least 365 years, so I'm using again similar technique, some with case uh, and average with case also to calculate percentage. By the way, um, as you can see this, uh, this query, you can also use them to learn some nice transactions SQL techniques to get the things that you wish in a very efficient, um, efficient way. So customers that survived at least 365 days, I have 91%. So this is my probability that customers will survive at least uh, one year. Right? Now I can calculate hazard function for every single 10 year day. In days, so for every single day, I calculate what is population at risk. So these are customers um, that uh, um, that uh, have been with me at least two days, 39, and one of them left me exactly after two days. So this way, I can find the most critical day. Maybe there are some days that are more critical than others. Um, this is especially true if you have, of course, uh, uh, subscriptions and usually monthly fees are paid. So at the end of the month are more risky days. However, also for, oh, but this is something that you don't need to analyze. Of course, this is something that you already know. But for retail stores, for example, you can find 
the, the most dangerous place and maybe you will find some logic in this. So let's calculate also cumulative hazard and survival. So we will calculate those that have succumbed to risk at specific tenure date and then calculate again with window aggregate functions how many succumbed up to this tenure aggregate and how many are still there, how many have survived for every specific tenure in days. So let's calculate all this. And okay, zero days, everybody survived. One day, you see, already have some customer that succumbs to risk. And let's see, like 10 days, cumulative with 10. And this is already 0.15 percentage. So for every single day, tenure in days, I can calculate the risk that customer will leave me, and I can calculate uh, also the probability that customer will be still with me. So if we go to 365 days, I have 79 percent probability that these customers will still be with me. Uh, and then, of course, I can do further analysis. This is now simple additional queries. Customers that succumb to risk, okay, stop reason, maybe I can find some interesting things. Of course, um, there is uh, approximately one third of those that stopped involuntarily. Remember, I just used operator modulo. However, this one third has lower profit than those voluntarily. So I made some logic into keeping off those with lower profit. Anyway, I can do additional analysis, for example, uh, grouping by region, uh, number of cars owned, trying to find um, percentage of profit, those that succumb to risk. So, for example, I have high percentage of profit for those that are in Europe with three cars um, and left me, so maybe I should orient on this group. On the other hand, it seems that these are two orders, five order details. Details. I is missing anyway. <laughs> five order details. Um, so uh, probably maximally two customers, of course, so maybe it's not so important group. Anyway, I can also do some pivoting of those, any kind of this analysis. And I see that uh, it might be also an interesting point uh, that this EMP, this is now something you can see easily. This row was missing when I did simple group by. So nobody from Europe with four cars have left me. Okay, again, I should check whether there is any customer from Europe with four cars anyway. Um, so basically, this was survival analysis. Um, survival, hazard function. Uh, are, are the most important here, so you can find those critical time points. Now let's go to a little bit more complex things. So market basket analysis, and this is already something that you were typically used to do with R or with uh, Python or with other, other um, machine learning tools. So what we are talking about here is the association rules algorithm. And we define attribute value pair as an item. Item set is a combination of items in a single transaction. So item set is set of products in a single order. And then you have to scan through the data set and try to find the item set that tend to appear together in many transactions. And then you calculate different terms. So first, the most important maybe thing is support. Uh, it's, uh, you can express this as a percentage or even as an absolute number. So number of rows with the item set with the combination of products compared to total number, the total number of rows for all, let's say, if we have orders, order lines, compared to the total number of order lines. <clears throat> so in this case, we have five transactions, and we can see that in this simple case, um, for the, uh, the, the combination of item set 
uh, cola and frozen pizza appears twice, appears in transaction one and transaction three. Now it tries to express association rules, a statement, if then statement. So if customers purchase cola, then they will purchase frozen pizza. Support for this rule is 0.4, so 40%. Now, um, uh, of course, the question is, what if I turn the rule around? Is there any logic or any order? Maybe some product explains better the other than the opposite. Let's take a look for uh, uh, at the transaction two, where we have milk and potato chips. But we have milk also in transaction one and transaction four. We don't have potato chips in any other transaction. What you can see that if potato chips is in item six, then milk is in item six for every single time when potato chips were there. The opposite is not true. Uh, when milk is in the item six, potato chips is there only in one third of time. So apparently there is kind of higher connection between potato chips. Both rules, if milk then potato chips, and if potato chips then milk, have the same support. However, we need another measure that will show that potato chips is strongly more, uh, more stronger, has more stronger association with milk than the opposite. So we can define the confidence. And the confidence is the support for the combination divided by the support for the condition. So combination potato chips and milk has support 0 0.2. Uh, and support for milk is 0 0.6, while the support for potato chips is 0 0.2. So the confidence for the rule, if customers purchase milk, they will purchase potato chips is 0 0.33, while the confidence for the rule, if customers purchase potato chips, then they will purchase milk is 1. Apparently, the second rule might be more important. Um, and Sometimes you might even define order in order lines. Of course, in a retail store, you cannot rely upon the order because, of course, uh, uh, order in the basket is completely different than the order at the cashier, and you have data from the cashier, not actually from the uh, adding items to the basket. However, if you have VIPs, uh, then you can also add sequence and, and calculate also uh, rules based on the sequence. So, uh, uh, sequential association rules enforce particular order in purchases. Uh, this can be enforced through date time or simply sequential number, and this is very, very frequent case in, in uh, your data. So, you have order lines with a sequential number. Okay, so let's see how we can do association uh, rules with um, with transact sequence. So in Adventure Work DW, there are already two views prepared for this kind of analysis. So we have views called we associate line items and we associate orders. These are orders and line items. For better performance, I will materialize these views and add a primary key to my table. Okay, and let me now show you the content. So these are orders. Orders are not really so important here. I have them just for having additional attributes like region, income group. So I will be able to do also some more advanced analysis using this data. What is important is this line items. So I have order number and I have line number. And by the way, um, the, this is not a total sales. This is based on um, fact internet sales only, not a reseller sales, uh, which means that I can rely upon the order because this was internet sales. So uh, line number one simply means that product row 350 W was added to the basket before product cycling kept with line number two. So I can also do sequential association rules. So let's start calculating things. Support for single item is simply, I will calculate count 
of uh, line items for every single model, and I see the most popular is Sports 100, then water bottle, and so on. Now I can start with the opposite analysis, finding all models that have been purchased only once in a single order. So these are those models that are not well associated with any other other model because they are they are um, purchased very very exclusively. So I have a mo a models that have been purchased only once in a single order. So these are these products. Now the problem with association rules is that you have to do more than just simple analysis. This is something that I see very very frequently. You know. Um, Using association rules in R or Python is really simple. However, people forget to look this from all different kinds of perspectives and then make wrong conclusions. Here is an interesting perspective. Water bottle was second most popular product, yet it also appears uh, very frequently completely alone. Now, does this tell you something? Um, might some other product be more important for, for market baskets, uh, because water bottle is apparently uh, something that people purchase, purchase quickly when they realize they forgot it when they went cycling and then they stop at the first store. Why is it important to, to arrange it in, in uh, your shelves in such a way that it would force other products, or if you have internet sales, to offer it? immediately with other products. And I can also pivot those products uh, see, by region because I have this data and I can see if there are many, some regions where I have uh, especially these this, uh, products bought only once. For example, North America is very, very typically buying water bottle only, only once. Um, also, I can do this by income group. Okay, this is just further analysis of those models that are not so good in associating with others. And here it's not so important this uh, difference that it was with the region. Now let's do the actual rules. This was just an intermediate, so just to remind you that you always have to look at these things from multiple sites, otherwise you can make wrong conclusions. Um, you know that association rules are always, always uh, used in web sales, any website is using them. However, I still find this is simple algorithm, however, the implementation in practically every website I know is, is uh, very primitive. For example, you know, if I go and browse Amazon for books, I will immediately get get uh, recommendations for my own books, which I will definitely not purchase. Or um, last time, uh, after, after I was in Divinity Conference in Oakland, I, my next trip was to Vienna last trip before quarantine. Uh, and I remember immediately when I arrived to Vienna, of course, this is country, this is short distance from Ljubljana where I live. Anyway, first thing when I connected to internet, connected, uh, first thing booking.com started to offer me hotels for Ljubljana. And I was thinking, yes, great. You know, they have my address. They know I came from Ljubljana. I will return to Ljubljana, so I will return to my home, not to a hotel in Ljubljana. Anyway, but um, you know that, um, that we, we do this error, this small mistake also, this is somehow natural, also, when we talk to each other, just think how many times you've been asked uh, by some foreigners, for example, visitors, which is, uh, how is this and this hotel in your hometown? You know, for example, just yesterday, a friend from Austria asked me which hotel would I recommend in Ljubljana. Well, I don't know, you see. I don't know. I'm not staying in hotels in Ljubljana. I don't think. But, and uh, we can't kind of still always make this uh, mistake. Now let me find item sets of two models. So I'm joining uh, line items to sales using quickly join on the order number and greater than uh, uh, operator on the model. 
So these are my pairs. And I see that the most popular pair is water bottle, mountain bottle cage, and water bottle, road bottle cage. Yes, of course, this is something you would expect because uh, uh, we already know that water bottle is not so good in this association that it looked at the first moment, and this is very logic and sense. I would just point out another thing that is uh, uh, not so simple. It's simple to calculate association rules, harder to interpret. Of course, you should know the vast majority of these rules. Of course, if you buy a bottle cage, then you typically buy also a bottle, right? So if you don't know the majority of these most important rules, if they are not known, not familiar to you, probably something is wrong, probably is wrong. So where do you find those? Well, you have to search typically a little bit further. So for example, here already the third one, Sport 100 doesn't sound like mountain bike, however, combination with mountain tire two tube is pretty, pretty high. So these are those that are interesting, interesting pairs. Now the same query, logically um, completely the same, however expressed differently is with cross supply. Uh, and this is this uh, transact SQL for each loop. So for each row from the left side, apply, apply table operator on the right side. So I'm searching uh, all models on the same, uh, where model is greater than model from the left for the same order number. Now I prefer this apply, although this is not standard ANSI SQL because it's easy to add additional apply operator. So this result is completely the same. Now, why would I add additional apply operator? Well, maybe I'm interested in frequency of items with three models. So I'm calculating two models in a common table expression. Then I simply add another apply and add the third model. So this way I can develop this step by step and calculate also item sets with four models, five models, and so on. I will stop here with three models. So this is the most popular triple mountain bottle cage, mountain 200 water bottle. Okay. Now let's express this item set as a rule. So I will calculate all possible pairs. You see now I have model is from the left is different from model from the right, so I'm calculating rules in both directions. And I'm expressing in outer query these rules. And you see now I have pairs of rows for every single combination. If water bottle and mountain bottle cage support is the same, then for the rule, if water bottle then mountain bottle cage. So you see in both cases I have support nearly 1,000. And let me add confidence. So I'm calculating these rules. And for confidence, I simply need, um, remember what I need is the support for the rule, uh, for the condition. So this is simply the support for every single model. And then I can calculate uh, support and confidence for both sides of the rules. And I'm ordering now the standing by support and then by the confidence. And this is already very, very interesting result. So what I have is mountain bottle cage water bottle and water bottle mountain bottle cage both have support 993. Yet the confidence for the first rule is 83% for the second rule less than 40%. Remember, water bottle was many times alone. Fine. And finally, uh, I can just add one more condition and limit rules only to those where line number from the left is lower than, sorry, line number from the left, yes, is lower than line number from the right. I got confused for a second. Anyway, so these are the, these rules also in the sequence, and, and so there will be less rules because now I, I enforce the order, and this is this rule, like with the highest support, mountain tires to cube sport 100, 
quite uh, not so high confidence, but the highest highest to support. And also mountain butter cage water bottle is also quite high confidence, uh, confidence and is typically before water bottle. Okay. So these were association rules. Now we have two more models. So association rules is unsupervised or undirected algorithm. Um, can we also introduce some predictive algorithms with Trusat SQL or supervised? So we have target variable, and of course the answer is yes. Um, and again, uh, I will not do many loops. This makes no sense to work in SQL. So I will try to calculate everything with a single pass through data uh, and uh, still get some results. Um, so probably I will not get so good, good accuracy as I would get with full decision trees or even gradient boosted trees or decision forest. However, I will get possibility to really work on huge amounts of data. So let me start introducing lookalike models with two different models. So I will briefly talk about classical decision trees, which do recursive partitioning to build the tree. Initially, you have all cases in one big box, and then you break, try all possible breaks using all input variables. Input variables are discrete or discretized. And then you keep that split that gives you the purest partitions of, for, in terms of search variables. And you can have different measures of purity. I will not go into details. This could be, become more complex, but typically if you have um, only true false for the target variable, you can just calculate the frequency distribution or the probability for each state. If you have more states, then probably entropy and Bayesian scoring could be better. And then you repeat the splitting process and continue and continue and continue. Uh, you have to stop somewhere, otherwise you get the results that are too good to be true. Uh, just imagine if you finish with a class with a single in your case, then of course the target variable, let's say you have two states, true false, has one state with probability one and the other with probability zero, and this makes no sense. So you have typically to stop uh, splitting when you get, for example, less than some specific number of cases, like less than, and many times the, this less than is limited to 10 cases. This is kind of default for many algorithms, uh, which is extremely low number. Making conclusion of that in cases is uh, very insecure. Typically, you still get overfitting. So some classes are still not populated enough. Why is this kind of old tradition to use 10 cases? Well, because in the past, we always used uh, samples. However, with Ersac SQL, I can work on huge amounts of data, so I can cases or more. So this is an example of decision tree. So we have some customers that like some products. Initially, 55% of them like, 45% didn't like. Initial split was done, was done at age, age 35, and then we continue splitting on education, and then we get some subclasses. Now, you see that the purity of the target variable like, not like, raised with the next split, but not in every single case. So for example, if we go to the left side, H35 plus 73% like, 27 dislike, and then those with the education less than two, 33% like, 67, so the purity has actually gone down. So maybe this would be also a class that wouldn't be interesting. So maybe you could also, some other would also cut off this class. Now, with Transact SQL, I cannot make this in an easy way without loops, so I will simply allow this development to the end. What does it mean? Let me also introduce another algorithm, k nearest neighbors. So this is 
the laziest of all predictive algorithms. What does this mean, laziest? Uh, lazy learning, no action until a new input pattern demands an output value. What does it mean? There is no training phase for this algorithm, no learning. It's, it's even lazy learning is, is wrong term. There is no learning at all. So what do you do? Typically here you have continuous numerical variables. And target variable is also continuous. You say that do the z-score normalization. And then when you try to uh, classify, make a prediction of the target variable for a new case, you search for the number k, 3, 5 nearest neighbors, and then you calculate average of target variables there. And then you say, this is my prediction. So this green case is new case. For k3, I'm, I'm uh, averaging the target variables for these three closest cases. For k, larger k, like 8, I can, I can get uh, better accuracy, but maybe then uh, I, can, I can get more, uh, more by. Anyway, uh, this is the point. Right. Now we have two algorithms, decision trees, k nearest neighbor. So how does it work in lookalike model? In lookalike model, you try to find a group of customers, people who look like your existing cases. So you simply calculate the probabilities for the target variable for a specific state. Uh, uh, you select this subgroup. And then you calculate the probabilities of target variable, and you define this as prediction for this new case. So new case is then simply uh, fit, uh, edit or assigned to this group, which has similar values of input attribute, and then on the fly, the probabilities of target variable are calculated. So we are using discrete variables, we can use group by expression, um, yet we don't need any, any of the loops. You can also calculate any, any other population moments, you could calculate deviations, skewless, curtosis, whatever you wish. So how will I find those groups? First, I want to simplify my query. I want to do a single join. Um, so I can do some data preparation. So I can calculate, I can create simple numerical values for strings and for continuous variables. So for example, here I have education and this will be my target. And also I can handle all possible unknowns. And then commute distance. And then I can do also all kinds of uh, beaming if I wish I could maybe uh, join these three groups to a single group. And uh, when I have continuous variable, I can use functions like n time to do equal case binning, means that I have equal number of cases in each bin. So for children, I can just convert nulls to zeros and so on. And this will be this my numeric variables. So this is just kind of, I'm not doing anything yet. This is just showing how I can calculate. Now I can simply join all well, these are, these are not join, simply do string concatenation. These are number of strings and this will be a single group. Education level three, community level three, occupation one, region three, age, first group, income first group, zero children, one car. And this is going to be then a single variable for my uh, grouping, for finding the nearest neighbor, right? So let me do this calculation. And I will also do this calculation now with less input data, only a couple, couple of uh, uh, variables, and call the new variable grouping factor. And then I will count rows in every specific group. Remember, if I don't have enough rows, these groups might not be interesting. So I'm also um, doing uh, additional binning. 
for example, number of cars, uh, group only in three groups, one to three, so all with uh, two and more cars, three and more are in group three, zero or one is simply in the first group, so I have less groups. Less groups means I will have more cases in each group, and this is uh, all sorted by number of cases in each group. I can still see that some groups are not really well populated, however, the most the majority of groups are very well populated. I have only, uh, I think, 18,000 cases, something like this here. But remember that um, I'm using very, very fast retractical statements optimized, so I could work on, on billions on rows and still make this viable in, in a reasonable time. Uh, and uh, then, of course, I wouldn't have any issues with the number of cases in this group. Now, I'm not doing any training. I'm just splitting the data into training and tested, and then I will use tested uh, to do the predictions on the training set. Yet there will be training set, just namely there will be no training. So, so I'm creating this grouping factor and adding other columns, and I'm selecting 30% for the test set, using script gen random function. Um, just a uh, just, um, small remark here, uh, just a small remark. Uh, typically, when people want to uh, do some um, random sampling in transact SQL, they use new ID function. New ID doesn't have really random distribution. It has uniform distribution. It's good enough for selecting a single case, but if you want to select like 30, percent of cases use much less known creep gen random function. It's also transactive random function that is using Windows security API to really calculate random values. So it's better split into training and testing. Yes, this is just split of the row. And I need actually the key uh, uh, and non cluster key index on grouping factor, factor on training set only. This is table that will be searched. And now I'm doing the lookalike model. So I am, uh, for every row from the test, I'm doing outer apply, so I get results even if there is no such group in the training set yet. And I'm still simply selecting average of five buyers, and, and this is the probability, and this probability is zero, greater than 0 0.5, then I declare this person as a buyer. And let's see the result. So this is five buyer. This is the uh, average, which I call probability, and this is the prediction. And you see that some predictions are correct, and this one is wrong. And I also see the count of rows in these groups. So where the rows where this count is very low are maybe uh, the rows that I should filter out, maybe not rely upon these predictions. Now I can also calculate the accuracy when I did um, predictions, so I can check all possibilities uh, or combinations of the actual bike buyer and predicted bike buyer, and then I can calculate the accuracy. So let's look at the calculation. So these are true negatives. Right? Remember, I get slightly different results every time because I do uh, different splitting and true positives, and then we have false positives, and then we have false negatives, and let's calculate the accuracy for this model, and I got 63 or 0.63 and more accuracy. Um, this is not that bad as you might think. Um, this data is made up. So it, uh, the, the, the correlations or associations are not so strong as they would be probably in real data um, Let me just tell you that I tested a lot of different methods on this data set and with uh, gradient boosted split. Also, I'm using only four input variables. Uh, with gradient boosted split, I came close to 70% accuracy. With the regular decision trees, I was approximately at the same level of accuracy as with lookalike model. And remember, in real life, you would have uh, even more cases. 
uh, definitely you would have maybe millions of rows, and then you could easily add more variables in to the research because you would still get groups with enough cases, and your accuracy will uh, would simply go up and up and up. I hope you are not too tired yet. I have one more predictive algorithm to explain uh, Bayesian inference. Um, and this is something that is also possible to calculate easily in transactical without without any loops. How? Um, the logic of this algorithm is kind of uh, opposite to logic of decision trees or look-alike model. So what we started with in look-alike or decision trees model was calculating the distribution of, of target variables in classes of input variables. Here, the logic is the opposite. We calculate the distribution of input variables in classes of target variables. And then we use this uh, probability for predictions. How does it work? Uh, um, let me give you a brief, a quick example. So imagine that um, I am buying a second-hand car, and from the magazines I realize that 30% of second-hand cars are faulty. And I seriously have no clue about cars, so my initial probability is that I would buy a good car only 0.7. However, I have a friend that uh, knows some things about car, and I managed to get this friend for a quick drive, and based on this quick drive, my friend declares cars as good or faulty. However, even my friend is not always correct. When my friend declared cars as good, and it was uh, actually good, uh, his, his friend is correct only in 80% of cases. In 20% of cases, my friend will declare a good car as a faulty one. Also, with faulty cars in 10% of cases, my friend will be wrong. So altogether, my friends will judge 41% of cars as faulty and 59 as good. Now, see, out of this 59, 0 0.56 were actually good and 0 0.03 were bad. Now I have to, to standardize this to probabilities. So 0 0.56 divided by 0 0.59. So I got this reverse probabilities, posterior probabilities. It is when my friend declared that um, a car was good, I have 95% probability that this car is actually good. So posterior probabilities after the classification are better than previous. Now I used only a single friend. What if I had another friend, more input variable? This was one input variable. Then I have to have a little bit more complex calculation for standardization, likelihoods to probabilities between 0 and 1. Let's say that I have a table of products with attributes, color, class, and weight. Um, by the way, this example I'm showing with this example, another option, another idea how you can use this algorithm uh, in an area where you wouldn't expect that they could be useful. Now, um, imagine that if you have data quality issues, many unknowns any analysis in your data, and you might want to try to find out if there is some association between this null. So, for example, if color is missing, 80% of weight values are missing as well, and if class is missing, 60% of weight values are missing as well. So the joint probability, color missing for weight missing, class missing for weight missing, or the joint likelihood is a, a, a multiplication of this probability is 0.48. The other option, color missing for weight not missing, and class missing for weight not missing. Remember, weight is the target variable, so we are calculating distribution of input variables in classes of target. So this likelihood is 0 0.08, and now we simply have to standardize uh, or normalize uh, the sum of likelihood to 1, and I get probabilities. So probability for weight missing if color and class are missing is nearly 
six, uh, 86 percent, while the probability that weight is not missing when color and class are missing is only 14 percent. So I probably found a pattern, uh, should focus on color and class and hope that if they are not missing, OSO weight would not miss. But the point here is uh, they have shown the calculation. Now, of course, let me show you the example. I have train and piece table already exist, right? So I can union them, see all of the data. And I have all of different uh, things here. So I have grouping factor and also the input variables. And so I can also show that the, which one is train or test. Now I will calculate my target variable is bike fire. So let me calculate the distribution of the region for bike buyer equal one. And I'm also doing this cross line. This is a single row count of rows where bike buyer is one. So cross line is simply adding this value to every single row. You know that cross line you wouldn't use in production, but if you return a single row, it means you are adding a column to every single row. Uh, and uh, of course, it usually works better if you highlight complete query, not just part of the query. And I have distribution of a region for bike fire equal one. Now I can do the full calculation for three input variables. I will use this time region number of cars sold, compute distance for bike buyer equal one, and for bike buyer equal zero, right? And let's do the full query. So this is kind of full calculation. So I said, you see, I'm using, by the way, grouping sets expression. And, and uh, so with a single query, I'm grouping over region number of car zones and commute distance. So, so this is grouping over commute distance for bike buyer zero. And this is the grouping for number of car zones for bike buyer zero. And grouping for region for, for bike buyer zero. And then grouping for uh, commute distance for bike buyer one. So this is the full calculation. And uh, these are these variables that were used. So now I will actually do some training, and this training will be stored in a model. So this result will be simply stored in a model. However, I'm doing this with a single query, with the same query that I used earlier, just select into this way. This time, so still I'm doing the training without any loop, with a single pass through the data only through the training set, and I will use this set for prediction. Okay, and I created my 26 rows. So this is my model. And now I can search for a specific row. So for region Pacific, number of cars, one, commute distance, zero to, uh, to five miles. And for this, I have these probabilities for by buyer zero and one. Now I have to calculate, let me go back to the slide, something like this. This is something that I have to calculate. And for the, these things, first I have to calculate products. Products. So I have to calculate products of this probability. What does it mean if I go back to case uh, so I can cal I, I need to calculate product, for example, for number of cars one, region Pacific, for probability zero and probability one. So number of cars one is this, 0 0.23. Let me do this. And then normalize them, right? So I need to calculate this twice. And then we have a region Pacific zero. We have this number. Uh, 
like this, I will calculate only for probability zero, and then I must add also these two for normalization in the divisor, and then we will use our brains to calculate probability for state one. This is from previous, so I will not copy paste anymore. So probability for not buying a bike for number of cars one region Pacific is 33%. And this one is one minus P0, but I could calculate also again with all numbers. Fine. What I need here is aggregate product. So I, I need aggregate product of these three values and aggregate product of these three values. And then I don't have aggregate product. We don't have aggregate product, uh, product aggregate function. What we have is some aggregate function. How can we get uh, product from sum? Well, it's simple by using logarithms. So logarithm of A plus logarithm of B equals logarithm of A multiplied by B. So I can calculate sums of logarithms and then do the reverse uh, operation exponent and I will get aggregate product. So let's do prediction with variables. Let's see. Uh, by the way, you, we know that logarithm is defined only uh, for positive values, not for zero and negative values. Yet we are talking about probabilities here. The only issue could be that some probability could be zero, not negative. Uh, but I'm not even care, uh, taking care about this. So I have um, this calculation, negative percentage, positive percentage, and now I, I will simply calculate all these values for this. So these are variables, right? So I'm storing this in variables, uh, uh, likelihoods, negative, positive, and then probabilities, negative, positive, okay? Now I can do this in a prediction query. Again, uh, create this for still filtering for a single case, uh, region Pacific, number of cars owned, commute distance, two to five miles. So let's do this in a query. And this is the true positive percentage, which is the 71%. Now, how can I make this for all tested? Well, I can create function that will accept these three parameters and then do for these three parameters uh, the calculation. Do the calculation. And once I have this function, tabular function, I can use it with apply operator and use it on the full test set. So I can easily get predictions for the full test set and I have original and predicted and also the percentage, so true percentage. So this one was then declared as non bias. And again, I can calculate the accuracy similarly as I did for look-alike model, and let's calculate the accuracy. I could also do this uh, more auto in more automatic way, but somehow I find this funny yeah, this way. Uh, it is funny for me. I hope you are not too bored while you are waiting till I copy and paste these numbers. And let's calculate the accuracy, and in this case, it's nearly 61%, and slightly worse than with look-alike models, but I also use less input variables. Anyway, I guess uh, this should be enough for now. So all together, what, what you have seen is that we have a lot, a lot of possibilities also with the SQL, and we get that very reasonable results, good accuracy, good enough. However, what is the real value here is that you do not need 
to learn a new language for every single task. You can do a lot of advanced analysis for existing data. If this data is in a relational database, intersectional supporting for the transactional system, or maybe even in a data warehouse, maybe even uh, using Kazoo Synapse Analytics. Um, and you can really analyze huge amounts of data. So you can really analyze what is called big data. Before I ask for questions, these are the three RADACAP courses I have already published, and more are coming, and of course also uh, Reza and Leila and Andy Lennart and other people are adding many, many interesting courses. Besides SQL Saturday in Auckland, there is also one in Ljubljana. Uh, we have reserved the last Usually, this is the last SQL Saturday in the year, so we have reserved the date December 12th. At this moment, we are still hoping that it would be a live event, but we will, uh, of course, follow the situation and probably need to, to change it to online event as well. Okay, so now we have some time for questions. So I will go back uh, to see also if there is um, any chat. Oh, they asked that, uh, can they access to the codes that you already have or uh, sign up? Is it possible? Sure, sure. Okay, so I will actually get that one and I will share with others. So if possible, your uh, actually codes, uh, we share it with others. So yeah. Uh, there are other some questions here. Yeah. Oh, thank you, John. Thanks so much, John. 